V.S. Ramachandran, uh, who's director of the Center on Brain and Cognition at UC San Diego, um, and a former BBC Wreath lecturer, and the author of Phantoms in the Brain, and has a forthcoming book on human uniqueness, Rama. Well, like everybody else here, I'm delighted to be here, and I'd like to thank Roger for organizing this. When he suggested I talk about human flourishing, I wasn't clear exactly what he meant, but I agreed anyway. <laughs> <laughs> One of the wonderful things about the kind of meeting Roger organizes every year is basically you can talk about anything you want, and it allows a free exchange of ideas. And uh, what I'd like to talk about is neuroplasticity in the adult human brain. And this is a topic very much in vogue. And uh, I'll talk about three or four experiments. One is a set of experiments with Donald Phantom Williams, which is old stuff. Many of you have heard it before. But in fact, there's a couple of new twists to it, which hopefully you will enjoy hearing about. And then a little bit about stroke. And the third part will be about a um, set of neurons with um, um, Jacoboni here and Rizzolatti and Galazzi and others have discovered and their implications for stroke rehab and um, also for can you make any predictions, psych perceptual predictions based on the properties of these neurons. So let me talk about each of these in turn. First of all, okay, about phantom limbs. Everybody here knows what it is. If an arm is amputated or a leg is an amputated, you have a vivid sense of the arm still being present. You know, you know, of course, that it's not a delusion. You know the arm's not there, but subjectively it's a very compelling sensation. Many people will claim that they can move their phantom, that it'll, you know, wave goodbye, it'll reach for the phone when it rings, uh, it'll attempt to shake hands with you, and so on and so forth. And, but we found this is only true of about two-thirds. About one-third of patients, the patients will say the arm is fixed or locked in one position. They'll say the phantom limb is paralyzed. And this is sort of an oxymoron. How can a phantom be paralyzed? But you listen to these people, that's what they say. Now, first of all, let's ask what's going on in the patients who can move their phantoms, or indeed all of us, when you move an arm, what happens? As you know, the front of your brain, the premotor and motor cortex, send messages through the spinal cord, through the internal capsule, through the spinal cord, to the muscles of the arm to move it. In a normal person, when you issue a command, you're getting visual feedback from the hand, from vision and proprioception, saying that the command is being obeyed. At the same time, when the command is sent, a copy of the command, what we call a reafferent signal or a feed-forward signal, is sent to the parietal lobe and cerebellum to monitor the intended movement. What, is, what are you intending to do? What's your goal? And then you use the feedback to, pr to provide a servo feedback loop so that you do this and stop just in time or do this to stop in time. You don't bang your face. Okay? So you've got a built-in servo loop. Now, if the arm is amputated, the same signal goes out to the amputated arm and it's monitored by the parietal lobe and is experienced as phantom movements of the phantom arm. So far, so good. Now, what about the patients who claim that they cannot move the phantom and it's paralyzed? When we looked at their case sheets, one of the things we found was a majority of these people, not all of them, but a majority of them, had a pre-existing nerve lesion in that arm. So the nerve was cut and the arm was actually paralyzed lying in a sling for a few months or a few years. And then you amputate the arm the guy has a phantom limb, but a paralyzed phantom that's equally paralyzed, as though the paralysis in the real limb has carried over into the phantom limb. And many of them describe this as being excruciatingly painful because the arm is in one fixed posture, and any attempt to move it generates excruciating pain in the phantom, just as it did when they attempted to move the real limb, which was where the brachial plexus had an avulsion or the nerve was damaged. Any time they attempted to move this intense pain, so there's some kind of heavy and link established in the brain, and any time the guy looks at his phantom, tries to move it, there's intense excruciating pain. And this we call phantom pain, and you see it in a majority of patients with phantom limbs. So why does it happen? We say, well, maybe in the early days after, amputa after the nerve injury, every time the patient tries to move the arm, he's getting visual feedback saying, no, it's not moving. No, it's not moving. And eventually, this gets frozen. It gets stamped into the circuitry somewhere in the parietal lobe. So then when you amputate the arm, the paralysis, the, what we call learned paralysis, is carried over into the phantom. So we said if this is partly a source of the pain, this discrepancy between feedback and feed forward, then maybe you can cure phantom pain by getting this chap to mobilize or move his paralyzed phantom limb. Well, how do you do that? Well, we said, okay, anytime he tries to move the arm, he's not getting any feedback because his arm is not there. 
What if you give him visual feedback saying the arm is actually moving? Well, how do you do that? He doesn't have an arm. So we hit on the idea of just using a mirror. So let's assume I'm the patient and my left arm is a phantom and it's clenched or in an awkward position and it's excruciatingly painful. Many of these people become seriously depressed, lose their job. Some of them even commit suicide. The pain is so excruciating. So it's a very serious clinical problem. About 60 to 70% of patients have intense pain. Okay, so you put the mirror there and then, when you, then you ask him to po position the normal hand so it mimics the posture of the phantom. And look inside the mirror, what you've done is resurrected the phantom visually, optically. And then I said, now I want you to issue symmetrical commands to both the phantom and the real arm, as though you're you know, clapping or conducting an orchestra. Do something symmetrical while looking inside the mirror. So the first patient I, said, I saw had 10 years of paralysis of the phantom with excruciating pain, always in a cramped, awkward position. And he tries to move it, he doesn't move, and it remains painful. And even if he attempts to move it, it becomes even more painful. So I said, look in the mirror, and he chuckled, and he said, I can see my phantom. And of course, he knew it wasn't there. He's not stupid. And I said, I want you to now pretend you're moving both hands symmetrically. And he said, well, I, you know, professor, I can move my right hand, but I can't move my phantom hand. You know that. I try every morning because I know it will relieve my pain, or maybe it will relieve my pain. I said, try anyway. And he started doing this, and he was jumping up and down like a child, saying, oh, my God, oh, my God, my phantom is moving again for the first time in 10 years. And I said, close your eyes and do it. He says, oh, no, my right hand is moving. My left hand is frozen. My phantom is frozen. Open your eyes. Oh, my God, it's moving again. It's moving again. So you could mobilize or animate the phantom, which has been paralyzed and painful for the last 10 years. And he reported immediate reduction in the pain in the frozen phantom. right? And I said, well, this is very good. I've been able to make this guy move his phantom limb. But I'm not going to get a Nobel Prize or a grant for getting somebody to move his phantom limb. It's a completely useless ability, if you think about it. <laughs> but then, it's, then it occurred to me, OK, well, maybe this is relevant to other types of paralysis, what, what you see in stroke. But there's been edema in the brain. Initially, swelling of the brain and the arm is temporarily paralyzed. Maybe you learn that it's paralyzed and you get stuck with it. So even if the edema goes away, you're stuck with this learned paralysis. In other words, one component of stroke paralysis may be this learned paralysis rather than actual damage to the efferent pathways, to the internal capsule. But then I said, well, you, you know, you can't carry a mirror around. What if you take this chap who's got a phantom limb, and he says the phantom is moving again, and he closes his eyes, it doesn't move. I said, OK, take this mirror box home and play with it for a week. Let's see what happens. If you keep on doing it for a couple of hours every day and look inside and the phantom is mobilized, maybe eventually you can throw away the mirror, and you, you unlearned the learned paralysis. right? So the chap takes it home, practices with it, and there's a long story which I'm going to not go into. But very briefly, the phantom starts moving again, and the pain is gone. And this has been about 10 years now. And for the first time in 10 years, the phantom pain, the arm is mobilized, it's moving again, and the phantom pain is gone. Okay, This is about eight, nine years ago when we saw this patient. OK, this is important because especially with, with the people in the war having lost their arm coming back now. And as I said, one out of three or two out of three patients with an amputation suffers from excruciating phantom limb. And we find the procedure works in about in the sense of pain being relieved, the mobilization you see in almost every patient, but the pain being relieved you see in one out of three or four patients. And if you do controls like TINS units or visual imagery, none of those procedures work. And there have been lots of control studies now showing the efficacy of this procedure. One came from Sao and his colleagues, the Walter Reed. They had 24 patients, eight on the mirror, starting from a pain of about 35 to 40, 35. And the ones on the mirror dropped down to about five, OK? and continued to drop down after four weeks. These guys had their two controls. One is a covered mirror, and the other is intense vi mental visualization of the arm moving with training. The visualization controls, the pain actually increased after four weeks. I don't, I don't think that was statistically significant, but it did increase. I think that probably was. And then, after four weeks, they were switched over to the mirror. They again dropped down in pain. So this, all 24 pa patients, in other words, drop down, including the crossover patients. There are now three or four studies, one by Herta Floor, showing that this effect is legitimate. They've done it double-blind control studies with placebos. OK, I think this is exciting because it's showing that visual input is going modulating pain, which we regard as something primal and phylogenetically primitive. And it may have other clinical applications besides just phantom limb pain. 
And Terry here and Pat here and I wrote an article a long time ago, what, 10 years ago, arguing that your brain doesn't consist only of specialized modules which are autonomous, and don't interact with each other, which are hardwired at birth. In fact, the tremendous amount of interaction between different sensory systems, so much so that the visual input can go in and eliminate pain that has been around for 10 years. What about stroke? Well, the reasoning is that people usually think there's fibers going from the motor cortex crossing over to the spinal cord through the brain stem, through the spinal cord, moving your arms or legs. There's a hemorrhage or a thrombosis or an embolus punching out one section of the motor pathways, causing either complete paralysis of one side of the body or partial paralysis of an arm or a leg. And that's it. In the first few weeks, there's some recovery, but after that, the standard teaching is after six months, there's nothing you can do. Okay? So we said, well, why not try the mirror? And Eric Altshuler, uh, who's a postdoc in my lab, he and I started working with patients with stroke. The argument here is, you may say, well, it's bizarre. The fibers are gone. What can you do about it? The answer in the first few weeks after stroke, in the first few days, there's a swelling of the brain, tremendous edema, and that temporarily interrupts the flow of signals to the spinal cord. And this goes on for weeks, maybe sometimes as much as a month, and then the swelling subsides. So our reasoning is maybe you get this learned paralysis in the first few weeks so that every time you attempt to move the arm, it fails to move. You're getting feedback saying, no, it's not moving. And that's established, and you get learned paralysis. The real arm this time, not the phantom arm. And then the swelling subsides, you're stuck with the paralysis. Now, obviously, not all of the paralysis is learned, but some of it is due to permanent damage to the fibers, uh, although even that may change, according to Rusty Gage. But for now, at least, we know that's, that's not going to change. But the component that's learned, we might be able to reverse with a mirror. So we had nine patients with a mirror feedback, same arrangement. He puts the paralyzed arm on the left side of the mirror, puts the normal hand on the right side, attempts to move both, and sometimes the patient starts crying because he feels the paralyzed arm moving. He says, my God, you've cured me instantly. Then he looks on the other side. Of course, it's paralyzed. It's not moving. Okay? But then you say, look, you get the feeling that the arm is moving. I want you to take it home and practice. And we did this. In three of the patients, we got substantial recovery. In three of them, partial recovery. And the three who did not show any recovery were the long-standing paralysis. And we used a control, which is just a plexiglass. And we told them this works. Move your, you know, move your paralyzed arm. Okay, that was about eight, nine years ago. Since then, there have been about three or four double-blind placebo-controlled trials, trials, two from German groups, so you know it's reliable, um, on, on large-scale trials of 40 subjects or 20 subjects. And we do these large-scale trials, you find a substantial improvement, again, in, not in all patients, but in a majority of patients, more than 50%, of the paralyzed arm simply from using visual feedback. There's variability, and the question is why. It may have to do with the degree of edema, which part is damaged, extent to which there is neglect, all sorts of reasons. But let's assume that, this is very important, by the way, because let's assume that we know that one in 10 of you sitting here in the audience will develop paralysis from stroke. And let's assume the mirror produced striking recovery in 10% of those. Then you're talking about one out of 100 here, recovering from stroke paralysis using this technique. And you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people across the globe, and now it's being widely used, by the way, I should mention that, after these trials came in. One last syndrome I'll tell you about, and then we're almost done, almost done. This is a syndrome of pain called RSD, reflux sympathetic dystrophy, or chronic regional, complex regional pain syndrome type 1. What it refers to is some people with a trivial injury, like a metacarpal uh, fracture, hairline fracture, or even a cramp, ordinarily you have pain, slight immobilization, and after a few weeks, it recovers, and you start moving your hand again, right? But in some people, it fails to recover even after the injury has healed, and the arm is stuck in a paralyzed position. The inflammation and swelling encompasses the whole hand, spreads into the arm, and it becomes inflamed, painful, and swollen, and it's permanent, right? And it lasts forever. And there have been all kinds of treatments. If you go and look in Google, there are 30 known treatments. None of them work. Some of them partially work, but by and large, you know, it's accurate to say none of them work. So we said, why does this happen? That's the first thing. Why would this happen? This trivial injury starts spreading and causing this pain. Well, let's think about pain. We ordinarily think of pain as one thing, but in fact, there are at least two kinds of pain, if you think about it phylogenetically. One is acute pain. You touch a hot something and you pull your hand out. And the purpose of acute pain is to prevent tissue injury, further tissue injury, by removing your hand from the source of injury. But then there's chronic pain. You have a fracture or a ganglion or something, and, you, and it actually does the opposite. Instead of mobilizing your hand, it immobilizes your hand. Any, any slight flicker of movement produces excruciating pain. And the goal there is to allow the limb to heal, because movement is going to increase the injury. 
So the phylogenetic, the functional reason for these two types of pain is completely different. So we thought maybe something gets messed up in the system, and any time you attempt to move, you're getting excruciating pain. Move, pain, move, pain. And this gets established as a Hebbian link. The attempt to move is linked to this intense excruciating pain in that arm. And that's why, after a while, you get the situation where it's paralyzed, and you, any attempt to move causes excruciating pain. Now, the inflammation is another thing which I won't go into, the trophic effects coming down from the sympathetic nervous system. But you get bone atrophy, too, in some of these patients. Okay? And it's not rare. It's a fairly common disorder. Now, what do you do? So we said, let's put a mirror, <laughs> of course. And you look inside, look at the reflection of the paralyzed, quote-unquote paralyzed, inflamed arm. Move the normal arm. At the same time, attempt to move the paralyzed arm. Now you're getting visual feedback saying, oh, the inflamed, immobilized, painful arm is moving fine, and it's not painful. So you're correcting that learned pain by repeating repeated practice. We didn't do this. We suggested this. Patrick Wall, who is the world's leading expert on pain, and by the way, placebos, and uh, um, Halligan, Peter Halligan, John Marshall, did the experiment, and McCabe did the experiment on nine patients with reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Three of them, the arm movements and inflammation went down immediately. Arm movements went back immediately after years of immobilization and paralysis. Three of them, there's partial recovery. The three who had long-lasting pain, no recovery of any kind. Okay? This has now been followed up. There are about eight, nine studies. Most of them not double-blind, but single-blind. Sorry, placebo-controlled. All of them show striking recovery. Unlike phantom limbs and stroke, which have been done in, with placebo-controlled studies on large numbers of patients, this has only been done on small groups, just to add a note of caution. But I think it will hold up. There are too many cases where this has happened, where the patient's gone through. Somebody, somebody once asked me, here's this patient with excruciating RSD, reflex somebody dystrophy for the last 10 years, has tried invasive surgery, sympathetic blocks, every conceivable treatment you can imagine, comes, uses the mirror, and the pain goes away. And somebody asked me, what's the control? And I said, that's the neurologist's control. Okay? But this person has gone through all of these things, so the patient is his own control. Supposing I bring a paraplegic here, nobody ever recovers from paraplegia. And I do some procedure and he starts walking. You're not going to say, what's the control? Right? <laughs> the guy is walking, right? <laughs> okay. So anyway, but having said that, obviously you're dealing with, with the pain syndrome and you have to be careful. But here is the real punchline. When they measured the temperature of the skin to measure the degree of inflammation, that went down in seconds when the mirror was used. There is no way you can fake that. Okay? And it's now dissolving. We, Pat and Perry and I were talking about intermodular barriers being dissolved, saying the modules interact. This is saying even the module and skin interact, not in some metaphorical new age sort of thing but mind-body medicine. But it's literally causing a change in temperature in a localized manner in one hand. This is discovered by Pat Wall, McKay, but directly inspired by a mirror study. So you put the mirror there, move the normal hand, the temperature on the dystrophic hand falls immediately. Okay, last point I want to make is, a, is, is about mirror neurons. Everybody, most of you know what these are. In fact, one of the world's leading experts is sitting right here. Most of us know that there are motor neurons, command neurons in the front of the brain, which, when they fire, make you move an arm. Messages go down the spinal cord, make you move an arm. Messages are also monitored in the right parietal and in the cerebellum, informing you what your intended intention is. I already talked about that. Now, it turns out a subset of these neurons, discovered by Rizzolati and his colleagues, what they do is they also fire not only when you move your hand, perform a particular action like grabbing something or putting a peanut in your mouth, but when you watch somebody else do it, the same neuron fires. And they've been called monkey see, monkey do neurons or mirror neurons. Okay? So the same neuron fires when you watch somebody else, as though you're adopting the other monkey's point of view. Same thing has been found using brain imaging studies by Yac both Giacomo and by, uh, by you. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so the bottom line is these neurons are allowing you to be, take the other person's uh, point of view of the world, both literally and perhaps even metaphorically. That's a different question. Okay? Now, the question is, if this is true, that many of these neurons are firing when I watch Pat move her hand, some of them also fire, by the way. You found touch mirror neurons and pain mirror neurons. So if somebody pokes me with a needle or somebody touches me, neurons in my left, right parietal are going to fire, the standard touch neurons. But it turns out some of them will fire when somebody goes and touches Pat and I'm watching her being touched. 
So this is the same thing with pain in the anterior cingulate. If I poke me, somebody pokes me with a needle, anterior cingulate neuron fire, and there is some evidence when somebody pokes Pat with a needle and I'm watching, my anterior cingulate neurons will fire. But if this is true, right, so I call these neurons the dissolving the barrier between self and others. Sort of ultimate example of empathy, so I call them Gandhi neurons, right? <laughs> empathy neurons. Because they're firing, you know, they're, they're experiencing her pain, these neurons, right? But okay, let's step back a bit. When I poke myself, I feel the pain, but if somebody pokes Pat, how close I am to her, I don't feel her pain. Otherwise, somebody pokes her, I say, ouch, right? I don't literally experience the qualia, as, as philosophers call it, of the pain that Pat is experiencing, unless you're Gandhi or somebody like that. I don't literally experience her pain. Or if somebody touches Pat, I don't experience touch on my fingers. Why not? Well, my conjecture was, you got real skin here, which is going and informing your brain, the non-mirror neuron touch neurons, there are also touch neurons which are not mirror neurons, they only fire when somebody touches me. Those neurons go there and veto one of the outputs of the mirror neurons and saying, look, don't worry, you are not being hurt, you are not being touched, that is, empathize by all means, but don't literally feel the pain. Okay, so that's what's going on there. Now how do you test this idea? We said, very simple, phantom limbs. Supposing, my argument is when somebody touches Pat, my touch neurons are firing a subset of them, but I don't feel the touch. Why not? Because my skin receptors are sending a null signal saying, shut up, don't worry, you can empathize with Pat, but you're not actually being poked, you're not being touched. If that hypothesis is correct, if my arm is lopped off and I have a phantom, and I look at Pat being touched, I should feel that touch in my phantom. And if I feel her being, if I see her being poked, I should feel the poke in my phantom. Answer is, yes, we've tested three patients, and this is absolutely astonishing because people have known about phantom limbs for more than a century or two centuries now. It's very simple. I'm the phantom limb patient. Somebody goes and hits Pat or scratches her or taps her. I feel it in my phantom limb. And we've done a number of experiments to show this is not confabulatory. The patient literally feels this touch of the pain. So in conclusion, what you're seeing here is you're now dissolving the barrier. So what we've done is to start it out saying there's tremendous interaction between the sensory systems. So the old view of the brain is you've got all these modules which are hardwired by, by the genome. They're independent and autonomous. There's very little interaction between them. Now that's a caricature. There's some truth to it. You know, the cough reflex is obviously modular. You know, I can't will it away. Well, to some extent you can't, but by and large you can't. And it's hardwired and it's probably specified in the genome. But what we're saying is that people have overstated this view. It's called the MIT view of the brain. In fact, there's a tremendous amount of interaction between these modules, and the modules are not completely autonomous, and they are in a state of, you can think of the brain as being, reject the view that it's the serial, hierarchical, modular view of the brain, and replace it with a more dynamic view, that there's a brain is there, and the different modules are in a state of dynamic equilibrium with, it, with each other, and indeed with the environment you're immersed in. And what happens in neurological disease is not punch a module out and you lose a function. What's happening in neurological disease is there is a shift in equilibrium. And using relatively simple procedures, whether it's a mirror or something else, you can shift the equilibrium back to normal. So that's the main message here. And what we have succeeded in doing is saying not only is there interaction between modules, different brain regions, much more than pre people imagined in the past, but there is interaction between the brain and the skin. It's not even intermodular, it's module and body, right? And not just that, there's no difference between her and me. So the interperson is also dissolved by these experiments. And this shows you how extraordinarily malleable these connections are, interactive they are with the skin, with other people, and of course across between themselves. And surely this has implications for education, for creativity, and all of that. Thank you. <laughs>